century, this world was being watched by intelligences greater than man's, and yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busy themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacence, people went to and fro over the earth about their little affairs, serene the assurance of their dominion over this small spinning fragment of solar driftwood which by chance or by design man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space yet across an immense ethereal gulf minds that are to our minds as ours are to the beasts in the jungle intellects vast cool and unsympathetic regarded this earth with envious eyes and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. So began a science fiction bestseller published more than 75 years ago, H.G. Wells's War of the Worlds. It was written and read as harmless entertainment. Science fiction was just becoming popular. Fairy tales for adults. And yet that world of science fiction is all around us, right now, less fictional with every passing day. The evidence is here. Our planet is indeed being visited by intelligences greater than man's. They travel in spaceships, in flying saucers. People all around the world are seeing these craft. The Italians call them Vichy Volanti, the French Sukup Volong, the Russians, the Tyushchi Targenki. In America, we call them UFOs. There are literally thousands of police and pilot reports of UFOs, and over 900 landing trace cases have been documented. Cases where soil chemistry has changed. Swirled circles that testify to tremendous centrifugal force, where something massive landed. But what? The military spokesmen of the great powers are suspiciously silent. Only one thing is certain. No earthly power has built aircraft that execute right-angled turns at supersonic speeds. And such craft are consistently seen and photographed tracking our test planes and space vehicles. Where do these alien craft come from? And what are their powers? And why are they visiting us? Are they perhaps reminding us that we are part of a vast cosmic connection? That we have links, even kinship, with worlds beyond Earth? Or are they, as more and more people believe, trying to tell us that the knowledge we need to survive, to grow, is right here on planet Earth, hidden in our science and in our past? Our planet is in crisis. And some say all this has happened before, a long, long time ago, to that mysterious, fabled land, the lost continent of Atlantis. In the 4th century BC, Plato, in his dialogues, vividly described an island continent beyond the Pillars of Hercules called Atlantis. Ancient Mesopotamian tablets refer to a land destroyed by the Great Flood. The Book of Genesis, the Koran, Mayan legends, the Epic of Gilgamesh, all speak of this once flourishing civilization whose science, it is said, surpassed ours at the moment of its destruction. What became of Atlantis? According to the records of Egyptian priests, in one cataclysmic day and night, the entire continent sank into the depths of the ocean. Russian physicist Emanuel Velikovsky has suggested that Atlantis became the lost continent after a shift in the Earth's axis. Famous psychic Edgar Cayce believed that by misusing the powers of the mind and interrupting the evolution of the planet, Atlantis became the victim of its own perverted super-science. 
and the people of Atlantis. What happened to them? Were they all destroyed? Or did some survive the Holocaust and migrate by sea and air to other lands? Did some Atlanteans retreat into the ocean and establish a magnificent undersea kingdom that still flourishes there today? Or did they, with their advanced technology, escape into outer space? And have they perhaps, since man first left records on cave walls, been returning in their spaceships to observe us as we build the new Atlantis? What evidence is there that man himself was not the sole architect of the Earth's great ancient structures? Did we indeed get a little help from our friends from space? The Great Pyramid of Giza is the height of a 40-story skyscraper. It's built with two and a quarter million stone blocks, some weighing 24,000 pounds apiece. Blocks supposedly hauled hundreds of miles by slaves and beasts of burden. And what are the knowledge necessary for the construction of such a monument? We know now that the Great Pyramid was built facing true north in the exact center of the land map of the world. Not the known world of 2575 BC, but the entire world as we know it today. The only way its architects could have derived such calculations would have been to survey the Earth from high in the air, make a global map, project it flat, then draw meridians through the precise center of the map's land surface. Either that or the information was provided for them by someone else, someone capable of aerial reconnaissance. Some of the pyramids in Spanish America, land of the ancient Mayan, Aztec, and Toltec civilizations, predate even those of Egypt. Tijuanaco, the oldest city in South America, is said to have been constructed by a race of giants whose homeland was destroyed by a great flood. Archaeologists have discovered amazing similarities in architecture and artifacts in Egypt and at Tijuanaco. Similarities which have led some scholars to suggest that these two civilizations might have a common source. That perhaps Egypt was the principal colony of Atlantis in the Old World, while Tijuanaco was one of the drowned continent's colonial outposts in the New. The sacred books and folklore of widely separated lands all tell of days when gods visited this planet wrapped in clouds or conveyed by fiery chariots. Are the gigantic statues on Easter Island faithful representations of ancient astronauts or Atlantean giants? And what of Stonehenge, Neolithic computer of the Druids? The parallel is not far-fetched for it would take an IBM computer to decipher the functions of this calendar monument, to predict coming eclipses from the complex alignment of the massive stone slabs, each marking a position of the sun and the moon. And more astonishing, the inner measurements of Stonehenge in England and the dimensions of the Great Pyramid in Egypt both indicate the precise number of days in a solar year, which seems to suggest that the architects of these distant structures had access to the same information perhaps even work from a master set of blueprints. The question is, why? Imagine, if you will, a single team of architects traveling from continent to continent, employing local people to construct navigational aids, great beacons that could be seen from craft orbiting planet Earth. Beacons still operational today. Certainly the most permanent evidence that advanced civilizations have been visiting this planet since ancient times may be seen in these time-defying monuments, a world apart. But let us consider what is happening in our skies today. It was exactly 8.05 p.m. when Air Defense Command received word that a mysterious light was hovering low on the horizon just northeast of Rapid City, South Dakota. Radar operators at Ellsworth Air Force Base shifted their attention to the northeast quadrant of the sky and immediately picked up an unidentified target. Air Traffic Control quickly contacted an F-84 patrolling in the west, asked for an interception, and vectored the jet toward the UFO. A moment later, the jet's radar picked up the unidentified return and locked on. The plane was just three miles from its target when the light suddenly moved away with a fantastic burst of speed. The pursuit lasted for 120 miles, but the jet could not gain on the object. Finally, the pilot abandoned the chase. At ground control, the fascinated radar men watched the unknown object change direction and trail the jet back to the airfield. The evidence is overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial vehicles. In other words, some UFOs are somebody else's spacecraft. There are no good arguments against UFO reality if we consult the evidence. 
Stanton T. Friedman, nuclear physicist and lecturer, has been consulting the evidence on UFOs for over 15 years. One of the most extraordinary cases he has studied recently was that of Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker, two shipyard workers from Pascagoula, Mississippi, who claimed that while fishing on the bank of the Pascagoula River, a strange craft emitting a bluish light descended and hovered just above the oyster flat 30 feet away from them. Hickson later described how three silvery creatures floated out of the craft, grabbed him, and floated him aboard. There was some kind of zipping sound, and when I turned all around, in this area out here, but 40, 50 feet out there, uh, there was some, some kind of craft, you know, it was it looked like it's going to come out onto the ground. But it, it came on down and hovered about, oh, about a foot and a half or, or two feet off of the ground. But we didn't know what to do, you know, I, uh, the river behind us and, and uh, that out there not knowing what it was. So, and then before we uh, had time to really do anything, it seemed like an open appeared. You know, toward the end, it was, you know, us. And the blue light, it had blue flashing lights as it was, you know, pushing the ground, but then they went out. And when the opening appeared, some source of light came from the inside. It was just almost blinding. Some UFO reports are hard even for governments to dismiss, especially when there are photographs to support the witnesses. At approximately 15 minutes to 10 Monday evening, several citizens from the East Los Angeles area owned our station and stated that, that they were observing what they thought was an unidentified flying object. After receiving several of these phone calls, Officer Weinkoop and I were dispatched into the East Los Angeles area to investigate these possible sightings. We observed the object traveling in a southwesterly direction and gave pursuit of the object. While in pursuit, I was passenger officer and I was broadcasting a pursuit to my division watch commander, a Sergeant DeGroen of Hollenbeck Division, LAPD. During the pursuit, I managed to take one photograph. This photograph negative was booked into police property using this report and this uh, divisional record number. Uh, the spacecraft was uh oval shaped on top and underneath like a large pancake blown up in the middle. It did not have any dome like many of them have reported to have had. And uh, it seemed to be about 200 feet in diameter and about uh, 30 feet high. One of the best photographic sequences on record was taken of a UFO over Trindade Island off the coast of Brazil. Military and civilian observers on the Brazilian training ship Almirante Saldana saw this metallic craft nearly 150 feet long moving in over the sea to circle the island. A professional photographer aboard the ship grabbed his camera and took these photographs, which were officially released to the world by Juscelino Kubitschek, then president of Brazil, as authentic UFO pictures. Evidence of UFO activity over water mounts steadily. Jacques Cousteau has reportedly investigated UFO sightings over South America's Lake Titicaca. Thor Heyerdahl saw strange glowing masses underwater during his famous Contiki voyage. And there are literally hundreds of reports from marine scientists and ship's crews of mysterious undersea craft. What is the connection between UFOs and water? Are extraterrestrials using the oceans of our world as highly developed bases for successive space expeditions? Or are these craft, as some people believe, piloted by descendants of Atlantean survivors who sought refuge long ago under the sea? What evidence is there to support this speculation? We now have the means to explore our ocean floors, and divers have located vast stretches of what appear to be the paving stones of giants, stones as huge as the blocks that built the pyramids crisscrossing the ocean bed in mid-Atlantic. Archaeologists have found the walkways and pillars of an ancient sunken temple off the coast of Bimini in the Bahamas. Are these undersea structures traces of one of the cities of Atlantis? Consider the mysterious triangle-shaped area in the Caribbean Sea that extends from the edge of the Gulf Stream about 150 miles east of Fort Lauderdale, Florida to 40 degrees west latitude in the mid-Atlantic. Known in olden times as the Sargasso Sea, this area is a graveyard of the unexplained. It's a place where strange things happen to compasses. Strange things happen to time. Down through the centuries, this watery graveyard has claimed Spanish galleons, windjammers, steamships, super tankers, pleasure yachts, and aircraft. Almost all disappeared without trace, as if the tentacles of some mythical monster had reached out and seized them. This area is known today as the Bermuda Triangle, or Devil's Triangle.
On December 5, 1945, five TBM Avenger torpedo bombers under the command of Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor took off from Fort Lauderdale Naval Air Station on a routine navigational mission. Surface winds of 20 knots, skies clear, visibility unlimited. Suddenly, just 15 minutes before the flight was due to land, Fort Lauderdale Tower picked up Lieutenant Taylor's frantic voice. The time, 4 p.m. Call in a tower. This is an emergency. We seem to be off course. We cannot see land. Repeat, we cannot see land. What is your position? We're not sure of our position. We can't be sure just where we are. We seem to be lost. Assume bearing due west. Well, we don't know which way is west. Everything is wrong. We can't be sure of any direction. Looks like we're entering white water now. I tell you, we're completely lost. Then, at 4.25 p.m., We're completely lost. And then, silence forever. Immediately, the Navy dispatched a Martin PBM Mariner flying boat, a huge craft with electronic tracking gear, with enough fuel to remain airborne for 24 hours. Aboard, a crew of 13. By 7.04 p.m., the Mariner 2 was missing. In three short hours, the triangle had literally swallowed up six planes and 27 trained men. By dawn the following day, the greatest air-sea rescue search ever launched was underway. 242 aircraft and 18 ships scoured the area known as the Devil's Triangle, but not a trace was found. Not an oil slick, not a piece of wreckage, not a life raft. Nothing. There's no comprehensive list of triangle victims, but the litany of lost ships alone reads like a guest list from David Jones's locker. United States ship Nina, United States ship Grampus, the steamship Santa Clara, Star Ariel, the home sweet home, the steamships Hewitt, Corner, Slocum, the Marine Sulphur Queen, the Southern District, the City Bell, the George Boston, the Raifuku Maru, and on and on and on. Ship names that descend from mythology, the steamship Rubicon, the Nereus, the Proteus, the Cyclops, the Constellation, the steamship Witchcraft. Theories about the Triangle range from piracy to tunnels into other dimensions, other time zones. Physicists have suggested that the lost ships and planes may have been victims of a magnetic phenomenon that disrupts radio communications, causes flight instruments to malfunction, but there is no conclusive explanation. The ominous question remains. Is this area controlled by some unknown intelligence? We are currently spending millions of dollars exploring the ocean's bed. Project Moho drilled 600-foot shafts beneath 12,000 feet of water in an attempt to decode the mysteries of the Earth's crust. And along with archaeologists and oceanographers, parapsychologists are joining in the search to locate evidence of the legendary lost continent of Atlantis. Myths from every country tell of gods and mermaids rising up out of the ocean. What if mythology is really condensed history and the tales of these enchanted sea creatures are in fact eyewitness reports? What if the whale that snatched Jonah from the raging sea was actually an underwater craft? Undersea colonization may be a reality within our lifetime. Oceanographic institutes like Woods Hole and Scripps are collaborating with the government in undersea lab experiments to prove that man can live comfortably in an aquatic environment for extended periods of time. In order to survive under the sea and in deep space, man is developing new tools, mind tools, telepathy, clairvoyance, psychokinesis. The young Israeli psychic Yuri Geller, who's puzzled scientists with his ability to bend metal with his mind and to dematerialize objects, claims that the power to do this 
is channeled through him from an extraterrestrial intelligence. Well, if Geller is right, we all have a lot of new thinking to do. <laughs> Meanwhile, the governments of both Russia and America are quietly sponsoring psychic research. Both countries have seriously considered using telepathy, the direct transference of thought from one mind to another, as a means of communicating with submarines and spaceships. Another country where ESP research is being carried out with the utmost objectivity is Czechoslovakia. Here in a Czech laboratory, we are watching an experiment in telepathy. The subject is being placed in a deep hypnotic trance in order to free the unconscious to receive the message which will be relayed to him. First, the subject is placed in a deep hypnotic trance. In this experiment, it is essential that there be no outside interference, that the subject's mind be clear to receive the mental message that will be flashed to him. Now the experimenter, previously unknown to the sleeping subject, selects at random an envelope which contains the name of a spice, pepper. He tastes it and then mentally tries to convey the actual taste of the spice to the hypnotized subject. Now the scientist is saying to him, what I taste, you also will taste. What is it? And the reply comes almost immediately, pepper. Psychokinesis, the ability to move physical objects with the force of the mind, is also a subject of intense interest to science and to the military. Here in Leningrad, under strictest test conditions, talented sensitive Nina Kulagina makes the magnetic needle of a compass rotate by sheer mind energy. Russian scientists have found that while demonstrating this ability, the magnetic field surrounding Madame Kulagina's body is only 10 times less powerful than that of the Earth itself. Using this same energy, Madame Kulagina can also make non-magnetic objects like these matchsticks, shielded under glass, creep toward her across the table. In the Philippines, psychic surgeons are reportedly performing major operations on patients without using any surgical instruments and with no form of anesthesia or bleeding control. Yet the surgery appears to be painless and paranormal healing takes place almost immediately. The most publicized of the surgeons, Tony Akboa, is removing a pituitary tumor from the forehead of a California businessman, Donald Westerbeck, who flew to the Philippines after doctors had warned him of the risks involved in traditional surgery. Here in Westerbeck's own voice is his description of the result of his operation. When I came to the Philippines, I was very dubious about this entire process, but I felt that it would be a shame to have the operation first and find there was any truth to the Philippine phenomenon. Whatever comes out may or may not be the right kind of tissue. It may well be symbolic, but it is now two years since that operation, and the symptoms, which were progressing quite rapidly have pretty much disappeared. I know that whatever happened in the Philippines had a certain effect on the progress of what was happening within my head. You're here for a psychic healing. We have healers here who are actually laying on of the hands. Now, whatever your ailment will be, will be affected in some cases sooner, in some cases a little bit later. You'll be subject to a psychic healing. You'll also be subject to psychic readings that will help us determine what your particular problem happens to be. The healers have this energy that flows through them, imparting a psychic energy. And this energy will flow to whatever part of the body. I think that most people that really get into healing professions feel like they have some kind of healing ability. They may not know what it is, but I think they get into healing because they're kind of led into it. I mean physicians, nurses, even chiropractors and others. Have you been doing any heat treatment or infrared or...? This observer is a licensed physician, an MD, one of the first to inquire into this unusual method of healing to see what it has to offer to his profession. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. No, there's no, no, no. There's no known physical cause for rheumatoid arthritis. 
but not really for the other kind, osteoarthritis either. Our usual procedure is to take psychic readings. This is a group of gifted sensitives who possess the extraordinary ability to diagnose a patient's illness by a method known as body scanning. They record their estimate of the possible illness by picking up vibrations directly from the sick person or by holding something belonging to her. Sometimes there is an actual transference of pain from the sick person to the diagnostician. The idea of an energy field or an aura surrounding the human body goes back many centuries. In biblical paintings, artists attempted to depict it by painting halos or aureoli encircling the heads of divine religious figures. Rather more recently, this NASA picture shows Apollo 12 astronaut Pete Conrad on the moon with a bluish glow around him. The leading American center of psychic research is the University of California at Los Angeles, where research psychologist Dr. Thelma Moss is experimenting with Kirlian photography, a revolutionary technique invented by Russian scientists Semyon and Valentina Kirlian, which captures on photographic plates the aura or energy field surrounding both organic and inorganic objects. Dr. Moss, could you tell us about your research here at UCLA? We've conducted about almost every area of research in parapsychology that includes telepathy, thoughts going from mind to mind, moving objects at a distance. Uh, primarily now, we're extremely interested in energy fields around the body. But probably the most fascinating work that we're doing right now has to do with a photographic technique that was first discovered in the Soviet Union called Kirlian photography, or more simply, electrical photography. And we've been able to get some pretty fascinating stuff on moving picture film using this technique. And I'd like to show it for you now, if I may. Okay, I'm going to turn on the film projector here, and we'll be taking a look at some of our work in motion pictures. Due to the efforts of experimental researchers such as Dr. Moss, the technique of Kirlian photography may soon be of practical use in almost every area of physical science. Inorganic objects photograph very differently from organic objects. Coins have a steady corona. We get the illusion that there is movement going around it, but the actual corona itself is static, and its boundaries fixed, whereas human beings show a remarkably different effect. This is the right index finger pad, and we can see how brilliantly around his finger there are flares, and the corona keeps changing its pattern. We took a young lady and asked her if she'd get drunk. Here she is, two finger pads on her right hand, before she's had anything to drink at all, and it is rather a placid effect. After four glasses of champagne, we see that she's become considerably brighter, and the gaps have closed and from the backs of her fingers are emitted sparks from time to time. After eight glasses, she's in a much better state. From the rear projection of her finger pads, there are brilliant effects. Now we tried before and during kissing. This is the left and right, male and female, before kissing, and we can see that the coronas of both are rather dim, with a gap definitely existing between their fingers at the point where they are almost but not quite touching. These same subjects were photographed during a kiss. Their coronas have become considerably brighter and, in fact, are reaching out toward each other, perhaps the woman reaching out a bit more to the man than the man is toward the woman. Here we find an extraordinary example, which doesn't happen very often. Do you notice the red blob of light appearing between the two people? In anticipation, we like to think of the kiss to come. While kissing, the white and almost pink colors have become much more prominent and it would seem the man on the left is perhaps enjoying the experience a little bit more than the person on the right. Now, Dr. Moss has also observed through the Kirlian process the dynamic interchange of energy between a psychic healer and his patient. Apparently, after a healing treatment, there's a sizable increase in the widths of the coronae surrounding the fingertips of the patient and a corresponding decrease in the healer's corona. Another fascinating aspect of Kirlian photography is known as the phantom leaf phenomenon. People who've had a limb amputated often say that they can still feel it, even complain of absent fingers or toes that itch. Now this, according to scientists, can be explained by the persistence of old sensory patterns in the brain. But for years, psychics have claimed that they can actually see phantom limbs still attached to the body. And now the Kirlian technique supports their claim. In Dr. Moss's laboratory, first they photographed an intact leaf, then cut away part of the leaf 
and photographed it again. For a short time, a phantom counterpart of pure energy remained where the leaf had been cut, making up a complete sparkling outline of the whole leaf. One of the most dramatic things in Carolian photography is the phantom leaf effect. Here is a leaf on the left side, it has been cut. We turn on the Carolian equipment by placing an electrode, and here we see no phantom. Where the leaf has been cut, there is a kind of gap. However, by lifting up the electrode and replacing it very vividly, you can see the brilliance of the phantom effect. Extending beyond the boundary of the cut leaf, we can see flares coming out from various parts of the leaf and from its cut end. We cannot explain the effect. We simply know that it exists and that we can take it. And about 30% of the time, we obtain this phantom effect. Dr. Moss, have you investigated any other types of psychic phenomena? Oh, I'm called on frequently. Um, psychotherapists sometimes bring their patients in because they've got some problems. One of the strangest areas of all is when we are called, I would say we get 100 calls a year, to find out about haunted houses. People think their houses are haunted. And we did one extraordinary investigation with interesting results uh, of a haunted house here in Los Angeles for the American Society for Psychical Research. Not far from UCLA is still another haunted house inhabited by Mr. and Mrs. Robert Rice, their five children, and a ghost. Mr. Rice, when were you first aware that your house was haunted? It was the holiday season of Christmas in 1969. You see or hear something? Well, it was more of a uh, feeling than either sound or uh, sight. It was one of these things that uh, there was an extremely strong presence in the house, and I got up, oh, I'd say it was one or two o'clock in the morning, and began to look around the house. Uh, I searched all the rooms expecting to find a burglar, but uh, there was no one, uh, no one in the house, but a uh, very, very strong presence. Soon after this, Mr. and Mrs. Rice called in a psychic to find out if their house was indeed haunted. They were told that the ghost was that of a young architect who had become very disturbed and hanged himself upstairs in the attic bedroom. Well, I was working in my studio downstairs. I'm a painter, and... Um, this individual had become such a familiar part of our family after a number of years that I more or less tried to communicate with him on working in this painting. I saw a man about five foot seven, very thin, dark inflected, wearing a white shirt rolled up to the sleeves, open collared dress shirt, dark pants and black shoes. There was an immediate effect of the painting taking shape. It was almost as if it were directed, although I couldn't move my hand. It's not really a painting of him as he looks, it's more of a feeling of his personality. The California Society for Psychical Research came to the Rice's house to investigate the case. And they went through the house and the different parts of the house, wherever they were, that they felt something, they would record that. They felt very strong feelings of him upstairs where he was supposed to have hung himself. There were unusual noises up and down the stairs, and it sounded like someone walking up and down the stairs. They also saw him in the same light, described him in the same manner that we had seen him. Much of their conclusions concurred with what we had told them ourselves. In view of the five children, there are absolutely no problems whatsoever. They're very aware of what's happened. It really doesn't bother them. They're used to the idea. We've never been afraid of him, and it's never bothered his living here, and we've been here for five years. Actually, we've kind of enjoyed having him as a silent member of the family. I'm Lucretia Black. And I am a witch. I practice witchcraft. I have always been a witch. I was born a witch. I was raised a witch. And my mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother were all witches. What is a witch? It's a psychic female who can project her energies and invade other people's subconscious minds, forcing them to do things they would not normally do. This is Witch's Mill in England where in the Middle Ages, witches practiced their ancient art. There were witches who worshipped nature spirits and used plants and herbs to make potions for the sick. Witches who cast spells to drive a neighbor's cow or blight his crop. Witches who wore charms and amulets to dispel the dark forces. In England, in medieval times, the church burned and hanged witches 
blaming them when someone became sick or died. In France, Joan of Arc was burned at the stake because the church was afraid of her amazing psychic powers. Down through the ages, people with psychic ability have been falsely accused of being witches. And as recently as 1970, in San Jose, California, an ordinary Midwestern housewife was charged with practicing witchcraft. For years, we have seen people lying on beds of nails or walking on sword blades, and we've thought it was magic or fakery. Now we're beginning to understand there is a thin line between magic and what we call mind over matter. And science has begun to study the people who perform these feats. Here in Hawaii, members of an ancient tribe walked barefoot through fiery coals without suffering pain or injury to their skin. Around the world, highly specialized rituals are performed that tug at the deepest unreasoning levels of the human mind. In Brazil, voodoo cults still flourish. Ceremonies are enacted where voodoo priests invoke the spirits of the dead to take vengeance on the living. Animal sacrifices, chanting, beating drums incite the crowd to near his spirit. Questionable occult ceremonies are not limited to the more primitive areas of the world. In San Francisco, as in other American cities, Satan is alive and well. And to prove it here with the full cooperation of the men and women involved is an actual celebration of the Black Mass. In nomine Dei Nostri, Satanas, Luciferi, Excelsi. In the name of Satan, the ruler of Earth, the king of the world, open wide the gates of hell and come forth to greet me as your brother and friend. Grant me the indulgences of which I speak, for I live as the beast of the field, rejoicing in the fleshly life. I favor the just and I curse the rotten. By all the gods of the pit, I command that these things of which I speak shall come to pass. Blessed are the strong, for they shall possess the earth. Cursed are the weak, for they shall inherit the yoke. Blessed are the bold, for they shall be masters of the world. Cursed are the righteously humble, for they shall be trodden under cloven hoofs. Some people still allow themselves to be seduced by the theatrics of dark and sterile practices. But most of us are reaching out to a new, exciting future. There is now a generation born to the knowledge that man can leave the earth. A generation prepared, even eager, for contact from beyond Earth. And we're beginning to explore inner space to learn about the amazing psychic potential of the human mind. Where then do UFOs fit into our newly expanding awareness of the paranormal? Perhaps investigative reporter Ralph Blum, author of Beyond Earth, a book about man's contact with UFOs, could answer that question for us. Mr. Blum, what do you think about the UFOs? I think we have to consider them as an example of Murphy's Law. Murphy's Law says that if something can possibly happen, it will. There doesn't seem to be much doubt that UFOs are happening, that they are real physical objects occupying both physical space and time. But the data also implies that UFOs may not actually fly here over vast, enormous distances, but simply materialize here, function as physical craft while in our atmosphere, and then dematerialize. I've interviewed Air Force pilots whose mission was to acquire UFO footage, men who've tracked and photographed UFOs and then just watched them vanish. Professor J. H. Bruning of the University of Mississippi has pointed out how closely a UFO experience resembles a psychic event. In both instances, something that, according to the rigid rules of science, shouldn't be there, appears and violates the known laws of space and time and gravity. Ghosts and UFOs seem to have a lot in common. Ghosts materialize, seem to float or hover above the ground, often communicate telepathically, then dematerialize just like the reports of UFOs and their crews. These and other fascinating phenomena such as time loss, teleportation, and spontaneous healing are all associated both with occult and UFO experiences. 
And I'm inclined to agree with astronomer Alan Hynek, who suggested that we may be dealing with an intelligence that knows more about the physical world than we do, more about the psychic world, and is using it all. Mr. Blum, I understand that you got down to Pascagoula, Mississippi, just 36 hours after Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker had their UFO encounter. Yes, I did. It was the first time I'd seen for myself the profoundly disturbing effect of such an experience, not only on the two men, but on the entire town. Nothing that powerful had happened to Pascagoula since Hurricane Camille hit the Gulf Coast. And it was quite impossible to sit in the same room with Charlie and Calvin and not believe that something terrifying had happened to them. They had me uh, one on this arm like this, and on the other one, you know, they had my other arm like that. And they just, I just seemed to lift up to the same height they were off the ground, and, and we just moved into the crowd. Now, inside, how did they, how did they lay you out? Do you remember how it happened? Um, yes, uh, they, I didn't see any tables or chairs or anything in there. I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't in there, because the light was almost blinding, but I didn't see any. And when they, when they carried me inside, they seemed to, they just leaned me by, you know, and, um, uh, this, this eye, well, I keep referring to it as an eye, it, it moved up the, in front of me about this close. Mm -hmm. And it started right at my eyes, looking right in the eye. Uh -huh. And it seemed to, it hesitated there for a, a, a few seconds, and it just started moving over my entire body. When they, they brought me uh, from the craft, that put along this area here, and they seemed to, they didn't drop me, you know, they just released me back to the ground. And uh, I fell, I, I don't know why my, my legs were weak, I don't know why it was a, the fright or what it was, but I, I fell onto the ground. And that's when I seen Calvin, he's standing right over here in this area, and he was standing facing the river with his arms outstretched like that, just like he was staring at something. A man in Missouri gave a paper on 546 landing cases from 34 countries. These all involved traces, that is, where some marks were left after the UFO took off. One place where this happened was on the Johnson Farm in Delphos, Kansas, November 2nd, 1971. The strange marks in the middle there are a ring of soil, affected by a UFO. There are a whole host of tests run on the ring. It's clear that something strange happened to the soil as far down as 14 inches deep. To give you an example of what happens to soil, the soil on the left was from that ring, obviously different in color and texture, and I might say from laboratory tests, also different in composition, from the normal soil on the right. As long as UFOs remain in the air and perform impossible acrobatics, we can all enjoy arguments about who is hallucinating. And the military can tell the anxious citizens you did not see a flying saucer. That was Venus, or swamp gas, or migrating geese, or whatever. But all that changes when a UFO lands and aliens disembark. One of the most amazing and agonizing of such experiences involved a couple named Betty and Barney Hill. While driving through the White Mountains of New Hampshire in 1961, the Hills lost several hours on the road. Unable to account for the missing hours and plagued by recurring dreams, they finally sought psychiatric help. While under time regression hypnosis, both Barney and Betty Hill relived being taken aboard a strange glowing craft manned by beings not of this earth. While aboard, they were given an extensive medical examination and told that they would not remember what had happened to them. This is a model of one of the UFO occupants as described by Betty Hill under hypnosis. They were under five feet tall, with grayish skin and communicated by some sort of thought transmission. In contrast, the creatures that floated toward Charles Hickson appear to have been servo mechanisms or robots. The pointed spike ears prompted astronaut Brigadier General James McDivitt to suggest that they were probably some kind of advanced radar device. Another version of what they look like, this is a drawing made by an artist, a composite based on hundreds of eyewitness reports. And obviously most landings don't get reported. This character is about four and a half feet tall or so. Two arms, two legs, a head and a body. Slightly different facial features. Uh, obviously not like any of our friends down here on Earth. However, there are definite parallels in behavior. They have Earth excursion modules, which behave very like our lunar excursion modules. Take our Apollo program. We have strange-looking flying craft carried on board a launch vehicle. They hover out in the boondocks on the moon, land, a couple of humanoid-looking creatures climb out, wander around, pick up rock samples, play games, then re-enter their craft, lift off, disturbing the soil behind them, rendezvous with the mothership, and zip off toward another planetary body. The same sequence, in fact, that have been observed here by UFO witnesses. One of our pioneer astronauts was Brigadier General James McDivitt. 
In 1965, General McDivitt spent four days in outer space as command pilot of Gemini 4. General McDivitt, have you ever seen a UFO? Yes. Uh, during the, my flight on Gemini 4 in 1965, I saw an object in space, fairly close to our spacecraft, that I could not identify. It looked to me like maybe the upper stage of another rocket. I tried to take some pictures of it, but unfortunately the, the pictures did not come out properly. Uh, we were, never were able to identify what it was, and all of our ground radar tracking data indicated that there shouldn't have been another object anywhere near us at the time. General McDivitt, do you know anyone else who claims to have seen a UFO? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, I know all kinds of people who claim to have seen them. Uh, some of them are very legitimate, and some of them, I think, are just having fun. I had an opportunity recently to meet a gentleman from Mississippi who claims to have actually been taken into a spacecraft. And quite frankly, I believe that that gentleman is telling what he considers to be the truth. Uh, he wasn't looking for publicity. He wasn't uh, trying to be funny. He was trying to be very honest. He was very sincere. And quite frankly, I walked away from the whole conversation with him believing that what he said is true as far as he's concerned. Well, I, I kind of thought it was people at first, you know, off like that. But of course, when they, when they appeared there in, in front of me, um, it was the most shock I've ever had in my life. They, they, were, they were shorter than me, I'd say about five foot two or three, and they didn't have a neck. They, they had, it seemed to come directly to their shoulders. And they had something uh, that, that came out to a point about where my nose would be, and, and on each side, the ears. And I believe that they looked like they were a little longer on the ears than the nose. But it seemed to me when he came out that doorway, or that opening or whatever it was, then just almost instantly they were right there on us. Their arms, they had arms, and I saw the arms moving here and, and in the shoulders, but they had welled. I mean, their, their fingers were welled, and then they had something like a thumb, and they were like this. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about the lie detector? When they were asked to come over here to talk to these people, they had in their mind that they, it was just a big joke. And if I understand it correctly, they ran one test on Mr. Hickson. The machine showed that he was telling the truth. Then they run another one. And then the examiner, he began to wonder himself. So he ran the third test, and he believed just what Mr. Hickson had told him. Sheriff Diamond, can you tell me just what happened that night? We questioned him at length. And then we left the room and recorded it. Was, that was all the conversation they had. Recorded between the two of them. And one of them kept on to pray. He said, I, after all I went through on this earth, I said, why should I have to say something like this? Calvin Park, I was questioning him, and at one time he wanted to climb the wall. I said, how nervous and how shook up he was. But since I was down there, and since I was a physician, and several other scientists and investigators were asked to, to uh, consult and, and, uh, and look into the situation, I was asked, and if, would I mind if I would be present? And I said, I wouldn't mind at all. And while it is still very difficult for us to believe that a, that a, a, a spaceship landed, and that robot-type uh, creatures came out and actually took these two people into, into the spaceship. These men, in my opinion, believe that they saw this, and that they were being honest in reporting what they have reported. Charles Hickson's story is not unique. UFOs first soared into the news in this country in 1947, when pilot Kenneth Arnold saw nine disc-shaped objects skimming along at high speed and in an unconventional manner. Like a saucer would if you skipped it across water. A newspaper man who interviewed Arnold coined the term flying saucer, and over a quarter century of sky watching began. For 28 years, these metallic disc-shaped craft, tens of meters in diameter, have been seen around the world, from Paris to Papua to Pascagoula. Although science has failed to supply a generally accepted explanation of UFOs, the subject has been investigated by the United States Congress. In 1968, Congressman J. Edward Rausch of Indiana chaired the House Committee on Sciences and Astronautics Symposium on UFOs. Congressman, do you believe UFOs are somebody else's spacecraft? Well, I, I hesitate in answering the question only because of this. I don't know, but my imagination tells me that perhaps, just perhaps, there is something that would permit a man to travel faster than light. Perhaps there is something that would permit an intelligent form of life from another planet revolving around another star to make that long trip. And that way they left out hundreds of uh, reports by... For more than 20 years, Major Donald E. Kehoe, U.S. Marine Corps retired, has been reporting on the world of flying saucers. I understand, Major Kehoe, that like physicist Stanton Friedman, you believe that we are being visited by intelligently controlled vehicles from other planets. 
I do, and I agree with the Air Force. They've had a secret conclusion to that effect since 1948. A few years ago, I conducted a symposium here on Capitol Hill, and the participants of the symposium were scientists of some renown. And they were scientists who had an interest in UFOs. And during the course of that symposium, photos were presented which purported to be UFOs. One of the scientists who analyzed the photographs at Congressman Rausch's hearings was Dr. Robert M. L. Baker, Jr., who has consented to evaluate for us two UFO films from the files of the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. We see here the Montana 1950 film showing two bright objects taken by Nicholas Mariana of Great Falls, Montana. The natural phenomena that is often given as a source of these images is airplane reflections. Airplanes, unless moving at unrealistically high speeds, would have to be so close to the observer as to be identified as airplanes in order for them to portray the kind of motion seen on the film. I don't concede these images to be airplanes, airplane reflections, comets, or other well-understood natural phenomena. We don't know whether these are sophisticated weapons. Uh, everyone denies that they are. Our own country denies that they are sophisticated weapons of this country. This film was taken in 1952 by Delbert Newhouse, a Navy photographer, near Tremonton, Utah. He estimated that there were approximately a dozen metallic objects shaped like two saucers, one inverted on top of the other. The official explanation was that the objects were a flock of soaring gulls. But Dr. Baker had this to say. Birds, such as gulls, simply don't make the kinds of accelerated turns at high speeds that were measured on the film. There also exists some meteorological data that would indicate that there were no updrafts that could have allowed the birds to maintain flight for long periods by simply spiraling. It would be more, seem more likely to me that it is some natural phenomena or even uh, possibly uh, something from outer space. There is, however, another theory. The Bermuda Triangle is not the only area in which navigators have been troubled by the odd behavior of magnetic compasses. As every school child knows, something strange happens to your magnetic compass as you voyage into the Earth's polar regions. Scientists have turned to space, to the upper atmosphere, even to the sun, to account for this magnetic anomaly. But responsible reports suggest a greater mystery. A large concentration of UFO sightings in the Arctic and Antarctic has led some experts to speculate that these regions may serve as landing bases for extraterrestrial craft. It's even been suggested that the flying saucers, in fact, emerge from and re-enter the Earth's interior by polar doorways. And at the center of our planet is their true place of origin. In 1947, Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd, in command of the U.S. Navy Task Force, flew 1,700 miles beyond the North Pole. Not as would be expected over frozen icy wastes, but across a vast land of mountains, freshwater lakes, rivers, green vegetation, and animal life, a land not recorded on any map. From the evidence provided by Admiral Byrd and other famous explorers of the Arctic and the Antarctic, it has been suggested that the Earth is not as we have been taught. A solid sphere with a fiery center of molten metal, but is in fact a hollow shell, in which a small amount of the original fire remains to form a central sun capable of emitting light and of supporting plant growth. It has even been claimed that the huge mammoths found frozen in the polar ice are not prehistoric, but were animals from the Earth's hollow interior that wandered to the surface and froze to death. Proponents of this theory estimate that the Earth's crust is approximately 800 miles thick with openings at its polar extremities. They suggest that Admiral Byrd and other explorers actually entered the openings leading to the Earth's interior without knowing it. These explorers assumed that they were still traversing the outer surface because the downward slope of the entrance is so gradual and because they could not see the other side of the opening, which is hundreds of miles away. Almost to a man, scientists ridicule the hollow earth theory. They will tell you that the only hollow spaces anywhere near the poles are located in the heads of those who believe in the theory. And yet a number of disquieting questions remain unanswered. How then do we account for the warming effect, the presence of increasingly warm winds as one travels north beyond 70 degrees latitude? Why do these winds carry enormous quantities of black dust? Why does colored pollen stain the snow, red, green, and yellow, over thousands of square miles of the Arctic? Why are all icebergs composed of fresh water? Hmm? And why do explorers find tropical seeds and plants and even trees floating in the fresh water off these icebergs? Where do all these things come from? 
Well, the answer to these questions is obvious to anyone who believes in the existence of an unexplored region hidden in the Earth's interior. But the hollow Earth theory is not limited to this planet. In his book, A Journey to the Earth's Interior, Marshall B. Gardner discusses the bright lights seen shining from the polar caps of Mars, Venus, and Mercury. Concludes that these planets also have hollow interiors and central suns. According to Gardner, the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights, result from the rays of that central sun inside the Earth, projected through the polar opening into the night sky. Now, before we join in the laughter of scientists at these notions, we should remember that a hundred years ago, the world's most prominent astronomers staked their reputations on the fact that rocks did not fall from the sky. Today, these rocks are called meteorites. Science, like any living thing, must grow. Now, one of the crucial new questions for scientists is how to travel through deep space. Are there cosmic arteries, openings maybe in the fabric of the space-time continuum? In the past, man ascribed immortality to the stars. But now we know that like ourselves, stars are born, grow old, and eventually die. At the end of their lifetime, stars only a little heavier than our sun suddenly blaze up in a supernova explosion, becoming giant galactic flares that collapse into white dwarves and then eventually burn out to become black dwarves, each about the size of the Earth. If a star is somewhat heavier, it will collapse to a much smaller and far more compressed neutron star about 10 miles in diameter. But what happens to stars at least three times the size of our sun? Those which do not reach a quiet old age as a neutron or dwarf star. Scientists believe that the collapse of these enormous stars is so powerful that once it begins, nothing can ever stop it. They continue to shrink until the gravitational field surrounding them is so strong it becomes completely closed off from the rest of space. Nothing that enters this region can ever escape, not even light. And so these stars become invisible black holes in the fabric of space. Stars that have blinked out and died, yet are still there, exercising a devastating effect on every particle of matter that enters their gravitational fields. Where gravity is so intense, it warps space, imprisons light, halts time. Astronomers are now speculating about the possibilities of huge rotating black holes in which the tremendous distortion of time and space is so extreme as to generate a passageway to another world. A future astronaut plunging down a rotating black hole could perhaps never return or communicate again with our world. But he might emerge in a different time, a different corner of the universe, or perhaps even a different universe. And it's not so unlikely that an advanced technological civilization could have overcome the hazards of black hole travel, harnessed their power to voyage through time as well as through space. In his stunning book, The Cosmic Connection, astronomer Carl Sagan imagines for us a federation of societies in the galaxy that had established a black hole rapid transit system in which a vehicle is rapidly routed through an interlaced network of black holes to that black hole nearest to its destination. As even more dramatic evidence of interplanetary penetration, we can look to Siberia just after the turn of the century. An unidentified space object hurtled toward Earth at over 30,000 miles an hour. Trailing streams of fire, it broke into our atmosphere, and then came the explosion. Equal in force to a thermonuclear blast. A huge mushroom of fire and smoke, an explosion like none recorded on Earth before that left traces of radioactivity and felled trees within a 40-mile radius. And yet there was no sign of a crater. On January 7, 1948, officials at Godman Air Force Base near Fort Knox, Kentucky, observed a strange object passing over them at high speed. Minutes later, at 2.30 p.m., a squadron of P-51 fighters approaching from the south was asked by the Godman Tower to investigate the UFO. Captain Thomas Mantell, the squadron leader, left the formation and began to climb. At 2.45, Mantell notified the tower he was at 15,000 feet. There's something in sight above and ahead of me. Some kind of a huge metal object, but it's not a plane. I'm going to 20,000 feet. At 3.15, Mantell radioed again. It's now directly ahead of me, moving at about my speed. I'm trying to close for a better look. That was Captain Mantell's last transmission. All further attempts to reach him failed. Less than an hour later, searchers found the plane. Mantell was dead. His shattered watch had stopped at 3.18. Does our military have in its possession the twisted metal remains of crashed UFOs, the charred bodies of space crewmen? I don't know. There are no easy answers, but one thing is clear. With the formidable resources at its disposal, the American military has to have the best collection of UFO data in the world. And I really think it's time they shared that data with the people. I must say I have some sympathy for the military, especially the Air Force, whose province is, after all, the 
wild blue yonder. What do you do when something unknown is penetrating your airspace and you can't cope with it? The bureaucratic solution seems to be, when in doubt, classify. But I also have real sympathy with the people who are the victims of this policy, people whose lives will never be the same because they had the courage to report what they saw. I admit some people have been seeing some pretty strange things lately. One of the strangest and most bizarre is the appearance of huge hairy creatures that walk upright on two legs and are frequently sighted in areas where UFO activity has been reported. Somewhere in these dense forests lurks something for whose origin and existence science can offer no earthly explanation. Called Sasquatch in Canada, Bigfoot in the Western States, Folk Monster in Arkansas, Momo in Missouri, Skunk Ape in the Florida Everglades, these foul-smelling giants, some of them reportedly 10 feet in height, crash around in the undergrowth, uproot trees, invade logging camps, and terrify witnesses. What are these creatures? Where do they come from? How did they get here? Recently, an astonishing number of Bigfoot reports have coincided with UFO sightings and landings. Are the UFOs dropping these creatures here to see if they can live on our Earth? And why has no one found any bones or the remains of one of them? Do these giants, as psychic Peter Herkus claims, decompose into powder when they die? Or are they perhaps picked up again by the UFOs to be examined in alien laboratories? Is the Bigfoot a cosmic mutation? Incredible as this notion may seem, we're contemplating even stranger possibilities in our own laboratories. In 1818, when Mary Shelley first conceived of the Baron Frankenstein, the idea of one human being fabricating another was sheer fantasy. Now the inconceivable has become a near reality, as scientists around the world do research in the new and ominous field of genetic engineering. By a process known as cloning, we can now reproduce genetically identical copies of an individual organism. Already experiments in cloning plants and lower animal forms have been successful. The way has been paved for similar experiments with human cells. At the University of California at San Diego, Dr. Walter Desmond is carrying out research in cloning. In this laboratory, we're working with a variety of cultured cell lines. These are cells originating from various tissues in the body, which can grow essentially forever in culture vessels. The material from which we start, the animal tissue, is made up of a number of different kinds of cells. Since we are often interested in studying only one cell type, it is desirable to have cultures which come from a single cell. We would expect then all cells in such a culture to be identical. This is accomplished by cloning, putting a very small number, even one cell, in a culture dish and allowing the individual cells to grow. Colonies of cells arising where there was originally only one can be isolated and studied with the assurance that all of these cells are of identical origin. There's still some question whether cells of higher animals have this potential. At the University of Indiana, Dr. Janice Brothers has been doing extensive work on the development of lower animal forms, such as salamanders, from a single parental source. Thus, the new specimen salamander grows up to be essentially an identical twin, a generation removed, of the single parent. Axolotls are a type of salamander which come from Lake Yacomoco in Mexico. The axolotl is useful to scientists because many mutations have been described in this animal. The development of each characteristic of the body is controlled by genes. A change in a gene is called a mutation. Some of the mutations that have been found in the axolotl affect the development of the eye, heart, legs, skeletal system, and the pigment. The golden and white axolotls are animals which have pigment mutations. The four large dark axolotls swimming in the aquarium are a clone of nuclear transplants made by transplanting a nucleus from the cell of a normal embryo into an egg which has abnormal cytoplasm. First man thought that only man possessed communication systems. Then we made friends with the dolphin. And now plants take their place among the communicating life forms of this planet. Since 1969, Marcel Vogel, a senior research chemist at IBM, has been actively engaged in the study of man-plant communication. Vogel believes not only that plants respond to our thoughts, but that they are supersensitive instruments for measuring our emotions. Working with green broad-leaved houseplants like this philodendron, 
Vogel wraps a copper wire around the plant and attaches a small stainless steel electrode to the plant leaf. The wire is then hooked up to an amplifier and polygraph recorder, and he is ready to establish a stable baseline, a sort of plant heartbeat on the graph. One of the earliest experiments that we did was the threat of attack. With the help of his assistant, Chuck yeah. Mignosa, like Vogel will now um, attempt to project um, thoughts of attack and then monitor the plant's response. So what I'd like to have you do, Chuck, is to build a strong thought form of an attack. Chuck, think a strong thought of attack and then commit the act on the plant. Any shift of the needle on the graph is regarded by Vogel as a response from the plant. When the needle jumps wildly, it is the electrical equivalent of a human scream. Next, we will see both Marcel Vogel's and the plant's response to his assistant, Tom Montalbano's directed thoughts. Both the plant and Marcel Vogel are tied into the narco-physiograph biofeedback machine. This is the plant response telemetered through the stainless steel electrodes. Here is Marcel's galvanic skin response. This trace is Marcel's pressure and his cardiovascular relaxation and tension of the blood vessels. This trace is the temperature variation coming from Marcel's hand. As you can see, it's lowering. Now I'll be quiet. Now I'll focus into you, Tom. Tom, do you like women? Definitely. Now that's, <laughs> that's <exciting. laughs> And this time I'll focus on to your liking of women. Now here you have my response to your thought, but nothing with the plant yet. Now we're getting an emotion, a response, you see, right here. I had a thought of doing some healing work. Good. Now repeat that operation, that thought. There's the repeat. There you picked it up. Now a transfer. See, your mind was locked in. There's the thought find the transfer. All right. Look at this. <laughs> There's a response to our personal interaction. It's always a thrill to me when I see this happen because it's hard to believe that we are all linked together with thought. So we really become one with each other and nature. And that's why I love this type of work. Now here's my response to the thought of love. I said the word love. But look at the Marcel Vogel is pointing out how, with identical equipment, the plant's response is greater than his own that it actually picks up more information and is therefore a finer instrument for measuring emotion than man himself. Research into the secret life of plants raises some awesome moral questions. Should we, for instance, give up cutting roses in our gardens? Should we eat only vegetables that have died a natural death? And what is natural when we speak of death? The human race has come a long way since Faust sold his soul to the devil. Now we are ready to negotiate with death, to treat dying and death as a disease, and a curable disease at that. In March of 1963, biologists at the University of Oklahoma confirmed that the skin cells of the Egyptian princess Mene were still intact and, in effect, alive. Yet Princess Mene has been dead for several thousand years. Ancient Egyptian priests apparently knew many of the secrets of life preservation, secrets we are now in the process of rediscovering through a branch of science so new that most people had never heard of it. The name is cryonics. Cryonics is a program of extended life. Because of the tremendous gap between the research laboratory and the general practitioner's office, it appears it is no longer appropriate to bury or cremate an individual simply because he is suffering from a terminal disease and has suffered a cardiac arrest. In fact, there is much more we can do utilizing the newest developments and breakthroughs in the science of cryobiology. In fact, cryonics regards dying and death as a disease, most serious indeed, but not necessarily incurable. How do you cure a patient of death? Well, under ideal conditions, uh, a patient would be in a hospital and just seconds after cessation of heartbeat, death certificate would be signed, constituting legal death. Immediately, the patient's body temperature must be reduced to zero degrees centigrade just as soon as possible. This is accomplished by usually placing the patient in a cold bath solution and rapidly reducing the body temperature. The purpose is that we are trying to reduce the metabolism. We are trying to slow down the dying process as rapidly as we can, uh, preparing the body for the second phase of cryonic suspension, which is perfusion, 
where the body is actually brought down to uh, temperatures all the way down to 300 degrees below zero. This process of perfusion consists of replacing the blood in the body with a biological antifreeze that protects the cells from these very, very low temperatures. Once the patient has gone through the perfusion process, they are placed in a temporary environment of dry ice until a capsule has been prepared, a cryogenic storage vessel made out of stainless steel that will contain the patient's body and also provide the low temperature refrigerant. In this case, we're using liquid nitrogen, which has a temperature of minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. At this temperature, for all practical purposes, time ceased to exist. We are not in the business or interested at all in freezing dead bodies and trying to bring them back to life. In fact, what we are doing is we are slowing down by utilizing low temperature biology. We are slowing down and stopping the dying process just as soon as it legally becomes possible. The church is very much in agreement with the objective extending and saving precious life. Here we have a young lady who was placed in cryonic suspension, and actually uh, the church not only agreed with the uh, procedures, but actually uh, provided a Monsignor to come down and bless the capsule in the hope that uh, indeed that this woman could be saved. How did you become interested in this research, Mr. Nelson? Well, as a child, I was fascinated with the phenomena of hibernation, how animals could survive long, foodless, cold winters. Uh, most recently, we had a, a real example of uh, a human being, a young man by the name of Mando Sicaros, who wanted to escape from Cuba. And he conceived of the idea of stowing away in the real well of a high-flying uh, jet. He uh, didn't realize that the ordeal that he was about to encounter was the situation where the altitude at 39,000 feet does not sustain, have enough oxygen to sustain life, or that the outside temperature was minus 40 degrees, and that the wheel well is not a pressurized compartment. Any one of these factors uh, could have and should have taken his life. Eight hours later, uh, when the plane landed in Madrid, Spain, young Amando uh, fell out onto the pavement, uh, frozen, no heartbeat, and uh, to the astonishment of, of everyone, uh, about an hour later, uh, they detected a faint heartbeat, and uh, several days later, uh, he was nearly recovered, and 56 days later, he uh, left the hospital well. Scientists from around the world uh, came and examined the young man, marveled at uh, what he did could not be done by their present understanding, and the ultimate conclusion was that Amanda Sicaros was indeed the first artificially induced case of human hibernation. In the past several years, NASA has been allocated millions of dollars for hibernation research as a possible aid to space travel. Now, personally, I think it would be a very brave man who would agree first to be frozen alive and then sent out in a rocket to Mars. Is it possible, in fact, Mr. Nelson, for people to be cryonically suspended while they are still clinically alive? Not, not legally uh, in this country today, in my opinion. Uh, we often have requests from uh, patients, terminal patients, who are suffering terribly from cancer or other diseases and uh, who would like to have their, their bodies uh, chronically suspended uh, as soon uh, you know, before they suffer uh, the, the, the final stages of death and, and the agony and so on. Uh, however, it is not possible because of the legal uh, definition of death. The process cannot be started until cessation of heartbeat. Uh, but it definitely would be in the, to their uh, advantage, um, biologically, medically, and uh, I hope to someday that uh, we will be able to actually apply these uh, procedures to patients when they are in a, a terminal condition, if that's what they, what they desire. To some people, this is one of the most gruesome, I might even say chilling, developments of the biological revolution. But not, I think, as threatening or as mind-stretching in its implications for the future as is cloning. I recall reading a French essayist who suggested that when man is on the verge of creating life, God will return. He will smile wryly and announce, closing time, gentlemen, please. You know, not long ago, the concept of growing a whole organism from one cell, asexually, in a laboratory, would have seemed impossible. But already scientists are contemplating the cloning of human life. Dr. Richard Siegel, professor of genetics at UCLA, has agreed to discuss some of the ethical, the social, and even the political implications of science interfering with evolution. Dr. Siegel, is it likely, in your opinion, that cloned man will become a reality in the near future? The very definite possibility exists that in the foreseeable future, it will be possible to clone the most complex mammal of all, man himself. Uh, we have the theory, we have the scientific know-how, However, some of the very specialized techniques that are required have not yet been achieved. But there's reason to believe that with the concerted effort, some of the barriers that now exist uh, can be avoided. Where human cloning finally achieved, and I, again I must emphasize that it has not yet been done, I think that it 
would raise some very remarkable ethical problems for all mankind. After all, here would be a group of people who would have no proper father, no proper mother, no family, who would recognize from the outset that they were Xerox copies, as it were, of people who exist or had recently existed. And to contend with this through their lifetimes would present a most difficult uh, problem that would finally have to be uh, dealt with. Whether it would be psychiatric, psychological, I don't know. I would not like to be a Xerox copy myself. Uh, certainly cloning would raise, too, some very practical problems for man. For example, one can think immediately a dictator who could clone for himself a superior fighting force, people that would be virtually invincible as an armed force, people who could be programmed so that they would have no mental blocks against fighting. They would have no question but to go out and kill or do the bidding of the dictator. Now here's another possibility, really very intriguing, but at the same time quite frightening. We can imagine that a very wealthy, very powerful individual might have a dozen or so clones of himself prepared. And these could be kept in storage, as it were, and could be used when called upon as a source of spare parts. For example, when this wealthy old man's heart began to give out, he could get a new heart, a transplant, from one of his clone copies. And there would be no danger whatsoever of uh, transplant rejection. The heart would be destined to take and would function normally. And similarly, in the case of some horrible accident, if a leg were removed or horribly damaged, in the case of the uh, wealthy man, a spare part again could be taken from a clone copy and uh, this could be used to function. But here's the question. What do we do with the copy? from whom the spare part has been removed. What indeed would we do with all those pieces and parts and almost persons? What would we call the debris? Has man become too arrogant? Do we already believe there is nothing that science and technology could not eventually see? Are we indeed the new Atlantis? The challenge that confronts us is as enormous as it is exciting. We are ready to tap new resources. Telepathy, psychokinesis, Bigfoot and black masses, UFOs and Atlantis, Kirlian photography, cloning, and cryonics. These subjects all have one thing indisputably in common. People want to know more about them. To learn to forge new tools for mankind's future on Earth and beyond. Where are these new concepts and talents coming from? Are they imprinted in us from the beginning? Or are we being programmed from without in the sense that the Lord once programmed Moses for survival? Are some of us again in contact with angels? Technological angels, if you like, who are better at the game and wiser? I don't know. I, I think that they, they know more of what's going on down here on this earth than we think. And I don't know, they might have been, you might say, looking for somebody that, uh, that could, uh, that could, you might say, hold up under the strain and, uh, and convince people that, that, uh, that, that there is another world and there's some kind of life in the world. They. Who are they? Well, we're living in a troubled time. So perhaps the most pleasing theory is that they are from planet Earth itself, from far in the future when we have at last learned to travel backward in time. I like that. Because if that theory is correct, if they are our own descendants, if they are from the future, well, then it means we made it. We survived.